Well, good afternoon and welcome to our virtual education town hall. Thank you for taking the time to discuss the state of education in our community as we no navigate the coronavirus pandemic and as we prepare for the future. Our Keeping the Promise, a town hall on education program will grant us the opportunity to discuss how our community can continue to deliver quality education to our students in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and beyond. It's critical for all of us here today to lean into our positions as leaders and to continue to address the needs of our students. This will, of course, take determination, in initiative, and most importantly, continued partnership. As Mayor President, I recognize the importance and urgency of delivering quality education to our students. It allows not only personal advancement, but also the advancement of our entire city and parish. And of course, today is National Teachers Day. So it is very fitting that we're having this virtual town hall on today. For me, teachers inspire us to make the most of our lives, to strive towards our greatest goals and dreams. Teachers like uh, Mrs. Gilchrist, who was my sixth grade teacher, and Mrs. Dozier, my third grade teacher, and Mr. Uh, Carter, and uh, it's just so many, many that contributed to molding and shaping uh, the person that I am uh, today. And so our teachers are still doing that. They are still uh, helping our students achieve their greatest goals and dreams. And I just want to say thank you to the teachers out there. Now, today's dialogue has the potential to shape the future of Baton Rouge. Before we begin, I want to let you know that we are taking your questions submitted to coronaquestions at brla.gov. That's coronaquestions at brla.gov, as well as taking your questions on Twitter and Facebook. If you're logged in to WebEx, please select host to submit your question through the Q&A session. I'm going to repeat that. If you're logged in to WebEx, please select host to submit your question through the Q&A session. At this time, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker who will be giving a brief state of education in our country right now. Dr. Johan Juven is the president of the Institute for Educational Leadership. Prior to his current role, Dr. Yuvin has worked on immigrant integration, adult education, and career and technical education policy in both the public and private sector. From 2009 to 2017, Dr. Yuvin served in President Obama's administration as the Education Assistant Secretary and as the Vice President of the National Expert Group on Vocational Education and Training and Adult Learning. Now, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Yuvin. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just want to make sure that uh, the sound is okay and folks can hear me. Great. Um, Well, M Madam Mayor, I want to thank you for your leadership and for inviting all of our institutional leaders and our community members at large to this important town hall. Thank you also for inviting me and for providing me with an opportunity to share some of the lessons we are learning from our work with local leaders in education and workforce development ac across the country. I feel truly humbled to be in your company and in the company of such great leaders including Dr. Belton from Sun University, Mr. Callaghan at Louisiana State University, Dr. Smith from Baton Rouge Community College, and Mr. Drake, the superintendent at East Baton Rouge Parish School System. I also want to thank uh, 
my uh, longtime colleagues and friends, Phil Smith and John Daniels, for their partnership, which started many years ago when Kim Hunter Reed, whom you all know, and I first visited uh, with Opportunity Youth here in the parish, and where we held uh, a community leadership meeting with local leaders, including many of you, when I was the Assistant Secretary for Education under the Obama administration. Now, these are very uncertain times globally, domestically, and locally. And what started out as a single instance of the coronavirus in one region in China has now evolved into a global pandemic and crisis affecting everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic is a global issue that we did not expect or anticipate. The virus can affect anyone and can make everyone who has been exposed potentially very ill. We were not fully prepared for this outbreak and had no real plan in place as a country, nor did we have excess supplies and adequate hospital capacity we could engage. While we work hard now every day around the clock on finding a therapeutic to treat those affected and inoculations or vaccines to prevent it, we are learning many lessons in the meantime. As we are learning, COVID-19 has become disruptive to many of our systems, including education in so many ways. And sadly, it is affecting our most vulnerable populations and communities disproportionately. More low income individuals and persons of color are affected. Fewer are tested. Too many lack access to intensive care. Many have lost their jobs and others as you well know, take huge risks by going to work and working because they do not have the resources to self-quarantine or stay home. They have to work and provide for themselves and their families. They need to use public transportation and interact with others at work, sometimes amplifying their exposure risk. As Jumaine Williams, examining the conditions in the US's first epicenter, New York City, put it, not only are our frontline workers, the majority of whom are people of more color, at higher risk of being exposed to COVID-19, but the virus itself is exposing many deep and long-standing inequities in our system that marginalize and therefore jeopardize black and brown communities. As the mayor mentioned, um, I lead the um, Institute for Educational Leadership in Washington, D.C., and we are a national intermediate organization that works with local leaders in education and workforce development to create more favorable conditions for children, youth, adults, and working families to succeed. We have active working relationships in uh, 435 communities across the United States, and we focus in on the 100 communities where opportunities and resources are structurally absent or constrained. And what we try to do with in that work is work with local leaders to deepen our collective impact. These communities, as you well know, face significant inequities, all of which have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and have had a disproportionate negative impact on low-income families, communities of color, and individuals with disabilities. So there is a great need to address these issues now. And over the last six weeks, my team members and I, we have held numerous town halls and conversations within our networks involving about 7,000 leaders um, from across the country in education and workforce development who have actively participated in these action-oriented dialogues. And these are the issues that we've heard about, uh, many of which will resonate with you in the Baton Rouge context that I'd like to share with you. Um, as you. As you well know, across the board, um, there are individual and community concerns about in-person participation and work travel, conferences, professional development for teachers, everything that is in person now is seen as a luxury and sometimes presenting, representing a risk. But perhaps more fundamentally, what we see across the country is significant food shortages and insecurities. People are hungry and they lack access to food. In some communities, based on our dialogues, this issue affects more than one third 
of a community's population. And there is a continued need to triage basic needs and worry about summer basic food service distribution. Other basic needs, as you, I'm sure you're aware, deal with issues of access to hygiene and toiletry. But when we asked uh, the many leaders across the country how they were doing with this, they actually had partnerships in place that allowed them to address these issues of food shortage and food security with the assets that they had in their community. What they were struggling more with, however, uh, relates to technology, uh, particularly high-speed internet access and equipment. And what we are now seeing across the country is an exacerbation of the digital divide that already existed uh, because there is lack of adequate infrastructure in many communities. There is no high speed Wi-Fi available in each and every neighborhood. And we've also seen as our school systems and education institutions transition to online delivery and virtual learning that there is a new emergence of privacy and security issues. There's trolling, Zoom bombing, security breaches. And uh, many of our institutions are trying to figure it out how to best facilitate that transition from in-person to remote learning. Another thing we're hearing, and this is all over the news, uh, of course, is uh, unemployment. Record numbers of people are being laid off or furloughed. And it's not clear when or if those individuals will be able to return back to work. Many of these individuals are the parents of our children in our public schools or the adult learners at our community colleges across the United States. Access to healthcare and mental health services is another theme that we've heard about. For instance, um, because many of our schools, for very good reasons, um, decided to close down or partially close down, what has happened is that Many of the school-based health centers, for example, in communities where there are community schools, are closed and closed, and they are so for the foreseeable future, meaning that children and youth and working families who depended on that access uh, in the school context uh, do no longer have that. Housing, and I know this is a, an issue that is very relevant in Baton Rouge as well, based on my um, conversation with Phil, that there is a rise in, 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 in transitions, meaning particularly after uh, unemployment, uh, people uh, can no longer afford the housing that they have, and they are trying to find temporary solutions. And um, a lot of this ties into the unexpected high levels of unemployment, and in many communities, a shortage of affordable, readily available affordable housing. Um, on a positive note, we hear that family engagement and community engagement across our communities in the United States is very high. People are really coming together in a way that um, that creates hope. Um, but a number of uh, specific populations uh, are, are being left out, particularly the disabled uh, population is not at this point in time, it appears, receiving access to the services that um, they, they are entitled to and deserve. Um, a few more points and then I'll wrap up. Um, and the, the next point is about civil rights. And I'm, I'm very concerned about the fact that uh, civil right protections during uh, COVID-19 seem to have evolved to a deprioritizing of civil rights enforcement and enforcements that are necessary. And in many communities, uh, and this is very, very sad, We've seen a rise in pandemic triggered violence and, and even hate crimes targeted towards uh, Chinese Americans. Um, from an education uh, perspective, since we're talking about the state of education, I, I worry a lot about the learning loss, not just the learning loss that has taken place over the, the spring, um, but also the learning loss that we know comes, comes around every summer. And people are beginning to talk about the fear of summer learning loss, and now saying we might be facing losing an entire year, a year of learning if we if we cannot find uh, different ways to to sustain the learning. 
And then there's a lot of concerns, as you know, about anticipated budget cuts and, and how that may affect critical support services, such as the availability of school nurses, childcare, and um, some communities are beginning to struggle with teacher shortages. Um, so there are many, many things that the communities uh, across the uh, United States are struggling with, uh, but one, one area that they seem to tackle quite well is around the most basic needs, <clears throat> but the greatest inequities seem to be uh, focused on uh, technology, technology solutions or the lack thereof in many communities as it pertains to equipment and internet, not to mention, of course, the, the severe impact of unemployment and, and associated housing challenges. So at, um, at IEL, uh, we will continue this sort of rapid cycle research into these exacerbated inequities and the populations affected. And we, we are ready, our team is ready to assist uh, any and all communities that we work with to provide uh, community level micro data to assist in sort of targeting resources where they are most needed. Um, we are also canvassing. Uh, all the field generated solutions and are making them available to our large um, and networks that we operate and increasingly we have been asked over the last couple of weeks to uh, directly support district staff government departments uh, workforce development and community organizations and even community foundations to help them think through how they can accelerate relief recovery and reopening and reviving through planning and system development um, and then in closing, I'd like to say, when we look at all of our communities uh, around the US, it appears that most energy has been in the early stages of rapid response, but we see more and more communities, as is Baton Rouge, uh, beginning to address mid to long-term consequences and planning for recovery today. So irrespective of where communities are in their response cycles, Strong leadership across sectors and deep grassroots community engagement seem to be the two critical success factors. And based on my experience uh, working with you all in Baton Rouge, I know Baton Rouge has both these strengths and assets from the Capital Re Region Promise Team to many other cross-system partnerships. Baton Rouge, from our perspective, is very well positioned to weather this crisis and come out on top. So with that, I would like to turn it back over to the mayor, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuman. I could not agree with you more that I think we are positioned to weather this uh, pandemic and to come out on top. I wholeheartedly agree with you. And thank you for your invaluable uh, information uh, to our community, to those who are participating uh, today and uh, watching and listening to uh, this uh, webinar. We greatly appreciate your contribution. Now I would like to welcome our panel. Uh, first is the President Chancellor of Southern University, Dr. Ray Belton. Dr. Belton has been at the helm of Southern University since 2015. Before that, he was Chancellor of Southern Shreveport campus for 16 years during which time the campus saw significant investment and increased enrollment throughout his 28-year career in higher education. Dr. Belton has held leadership roles on the state and national level with several esteemed organizations, including the Southern Union Association of Colleges and Schools, the American Association of Community Colleges, and the Louisiana Campus Compact, just to name a few. Also joining us is the interim president of Louisiana State University, Mr. Tom Galligan. He was appointed to this position in December 2019. Prior to taking this role, he previously served uh, as dean since 2016 of the LSU Paul Abair Law Center. Before that, he was president of the Colby Sawyer College in New Hampshire. And before that, he was dean of the University of Tennessee's College of Law. Mr. Galligan started his academic career at the LSU Law Center in 1986, during which time students named him the outstanding LSU professor six times. Next, we welcome the interim chancellor of Baton Rouge Community College, Dr. Willie Smith. Dr. Smith serves in this position and that he has held since June of 2019. Dr. Smith has been working in the Louisiana community and technical college system 
for over 18 years. Most recently, Dr. Smith served as the Vice President for Training and Business Partnerships with LCTCS. Prior to that, he was the Chief Executive Officer for South Central Louisiana Technical College from June 2017 to June 2018. He also served as Vice President of Academics and Workforce Solutions at South Louisiana Community College uh, from 2011 to 2017. Our final panelist is the superintendent of the East Baton Rouge Pier School System, Mr. Warren Drake. He has been the leader of the state's second largest school system since 2015. Superintendent Drake actively works to improve Baton Rouge's schools through streamlined efficiency, improving academic achievement, and focusing on student and employee success. Prior to a three-year stint at the Louisiana Department of Education, he led the Zachary Community School District after being hired in 2002 to oversee the startup of one of the first independent school districts in the state of Louisiana in over 80 years. Welcome to everyone, all of our panelists. Um, I'm going to ask you to uh, unmute your devices only as you are answering questions. And so uh, I have some questions for you all. And I'm so glad to have all of you all on the uh, panel today. So let's talk a little bit about curriculum and instruction. Uh, what modifications has your institution made to continue educating students amid the coronavirus pandemic. And I am going to um, ask Dr. Belton to start because you're the first one I think I introduced. <laughs> Make sure your um, mic is off mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, well, let me uh, uh, preference uh, my comments by first commending you, Madam Mayor, for facilitating this uh, town hall meeting. You, your commitment to education has been consistent, whether it be advancing the, the goals of the capital area of promise and or facilitating uh, this meeting today. Your leadership is telling, and I really appreciate the opportunity to join with my colleagues uh, this afternoon to speak to uh, our response to uh, COVID-19. Uh, suffice it to say, you know, the arrival and spread of COVID-19 has uh, impacted significantly the lives of Louisianians uh, and, and certainly uh, has been impactful for Southern University and a and College. And over the last 45 days, we have uh, been guided by two uh, primary uh, goals to ensure the uh, uh, safety of uh, students, faculty, uh, and staff uh, and secondly, to uh, uh, advance some continuity that would enable us to continue to provide a quality educational experience for our students and, and uh, indeed uh, efficient administrative services. Uh, what we perceive to be a challenge end up being something that we can really uh, 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 launch as, a, as an achievement today. Uh, but, uh, our direct response was to shift all our uh, instructional delivery models uh, to one that were remote and or online. And, and of course, uh, we have always facilitated a number of programs online, but to really turn the ship in the middle of, of, the, of a semester was a, a, a great challenge. Uh, one of the things, though, that I was really pleased about uh, what's the degree to which our faculty across uh, the university really embraced it. And for those who was not familiar with facilitating uh, courses online, we had faculty members and staff working with them uh, to uh, help them introduce themselves to the different models that we've used uh, over time. So that has been a great success. Uh, and something that we will continue to do in terms of uh, uh, preparing our faculty for this new modality of, of instruction. But you know, one of the more telling things that came out of this um, uh, strategy was the recognition that many of our students um, did not have access to technology. Uh, and, uh, and, and as a result, 
uh, while we were encouraging students to go back to their home of record, uh, many of them uh, were uh, hesitant in doing so because they felt like they would not have access to the technology that would enable them to be successful in their program uh, of study. And, and so subsequently, probably to a larger extent, uh, we've had to uh, retain students on the campus, uh, make sure that our library was accessible to them, that computer labs were uh, available uh, for, for their engagement. Uh, and of course, where uh, our health systems doing medicine and, and counseling, uh, uh, both online. And so um, uh, it has been a, uh, an interesting time, uh, you know, to, to, say, to say the least, uh, but uh, recognizing that uh, many of our students are in need of uh, laptops, uh, that, uh, uh, that we understand that everything now has to be digitized, such that students can process uh, uh, and engage them more fully with the university. I think those are the things that we've learned uh, uh, to date uh, in keeping with our response. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Belton. Um, uh, I'm going to ask um, the same question. Since we heard from uh, our institution of higher education, I'm going to ask our uh, superintendent um because people certainly have uh, asked these questions and you all have certainly uh, stepped up to the plate uh, but our our student population uh of uh, k through or pre-k through uh high school what modifications superintendent has uh the school system had to uh make during this time to uh educate our students amid the coronavirus pandemic well, Mayor, first, let me thank you for hosting this event. And uh, it's, a, it's great to be with all my colleagues on this uh, event today. So I appreciate that. Uh, this has truly been a crisis that like we've never seen before. So uh, when this happened and the governor announced that we were going to be out of school on March 13th, we had about two hours to uh, before school ended that day, not enough time to hand out devices. I think one of the things that our that our school board did and our staff did and principals over the last four years was to purchase enough uh, devices, computers, uh, Chromebooks for uh, grades three through 12. And many of our high schools were taking those devices home. So we were positioned well with devices but the challenge we had was to find the connectivity for our kids. We did surveys with our teachers, we did surveys with our families to make sure we had connectivity and that's been our challenge. I will say this, we have had a tremendous amount of local businesses, uh, industry, and even individuals in Baton Rouge who have stepped up and have worked to, to get this connectivity for our children. And that's been, that has been really just a pleasure to see. So <clears throat> I will say that our, our school board has been very visionary on this. Our staff, uh, you know, a lot of people think when you're working from home, you're not working as hard. But I can tell you, and you can probably say the same thing, and probably everyone listening, working from home is, is harder work. And, and many times it's much longer hours, and it's much different. Uh, and but we had to do this for our kids. So so let me say this: we we have two basic uh, ways we are doing distance education, and that's through Google Classroom and through Microsoft Teams. That, that's our those are our platforms that we use. And Google Classrooms is where teachers uh, it's a repository for all of the information that the students need to go and and access. So that's a really good thing. Uh, being that it's Teacher Appreciation Week, let me say. Congratulations and thank you to all of our teachers. And I just want to open it up to all of our employees. Our employees have been magnificent during this time. And so congratulations and thank you for what you do. Uh, it's, been, it's been very difficult, but it's been very rewarding as well. So we are in the process of going full digital education right in the beginning after March 13th, we did packets. Uh, 
Every school handed out packets. We handed out thousands of packets. It took about three days before we were able to gear up our meal program. And it's quite incredible, but we're serving uh, four to 500,000 meals every two weeks. That is quite incredible. And we've served millions of meals in a lot of different ways. We are partnering with three different groups in the meal service, for example, to provide uh, shelf stable meals through cans and, and also fresh milk fresh frozen meals that are cooked by 70 restaurants here in Baton Rouge. One of the things that we were able to do is partner with City Group Hospitality that's, that, that is using the 70 restaurants here in Baton Rouge to help prepare right now frozen food, uh, fresh hot meals that are then quick frozen and those are handed out. And of course, the three o'clock project has helped us as well. I think, I think the thing that we are looking at and are most concerned about is equity around the parish. We want to make sure that every child has that connectivity, whether it's a hotspot or through some way that we can get them Wi-Fi. And I think we're doing a really good job of that. And I think uh, just you know, before I stop talking, I want to mention that our seniors. I mean, none of us went through a senior year like our seniors are going through. And it's you know the several thousands of seniors that we have. We owe it to them to give them the best opportunity. So. We are dedicated to an in-person graduation ceremony at some point. We can't give them a date because we're gonna follow the NOSEP and the governor's orders and, and, and do what we have to do. But at some point this summer, we plan to have a ceremony for those seniors. More than likely we'll be outside, may look a lot different than normal. It could be much fewer tickets for the families uh, and that social distancing we've all uh, become accustomed to. But we want to have that service for them, that ceremony for them to give them a good going away. And I can promise you they will never forget their senior year in high school. So we're working a lot through the digital education, distance learning, and of course our meal service has been very, very popular throughout the parish. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. You're absolutely right. Uh, the uh, graduating class of 2020 uh, we'll never forget this. I think we'll have a lot of books that will emerge from these seniors as they go down their uh, adult uh, journey or even in their college uh, journey as well. And uh, I want to say that I'm glad that uh, we have been able to collaborate with you all and provide uh, face coverings or masks for all of the employees that are working uh, with the uh, school system and handing out uh, food. So it speaks yeah, to the yeah. fact if, if, you know, that all of us recognize, and I know all of the leaders here, that one of the things this crisis has done is has caused, as I heard someone use the term, cross collaboration. So we've, had, we've collaborated, we've worked together uh, in all our different spheres of influence to, to move our city forward in every aspect. And now specifically as we talk about education. So thank you, Superintendent. I'm gonna come back to you. I wanna, uh, I wanna get some of our other panelists on board now. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Tom Galligan with uh, LSU, our interim um, uh, president of uh, LSU. Uh, Mr. Galligan, tell me what platforms are you using uh, to deliver instruction and resources to your students. Yeah, thank you. Um, and before I start, I'll join the others, uh, Mayor President, and thanking you for putting this panel together. Uh, and it's great to be uh, together with my colleagues, and I'll thank them for participating as well. Uh, earlier this year, you and I were together um, on the, at the parade and then in the PMAC to celebrate the LSU football team's national championship which was a great day and this is a little bit different. Um, but at, at LSU, we like to say that even though we're physically distant, we're still socially connected. Um, and so thank you today for socially connecting us. Um, and we're, we've used a variety of different platforms. Uh, Moodle is our course uh, management system, our, our course learning management system. So we've used Moodle. We've got state-of-the-art course development and housing software. And we've basically taken 30,000 students uh, in over 5,000 classes and gone totally online. So the, the effort has been Herculean and I thank my faculty and staff for that. And that's just 
Baton Rouge at the flagship. We've, we've, we've got seven other campuses as well, um, and, and they've done similar things. So we're using Zoom uh, a lot. Uh, I know we're on WebEx today and it works great. We, as of April 2nd, had spent over 1.35 million minutes together in Zoom. Um, and that was about two weeks worth of working remotely, two and a half. So now, early in May, I mean, we must be close to 3 million minutes in Zoom. Um, we're using also something called EAB Navigate, which is an app for students to make appointments to manage their coursework and, and the like. Our health science center is our, our, our health center is using Zoom uh, and other vehicles for telemedicine. Our UREC is using Zoom and other methods to lead classes. So you can still work out, not physically in the UREC, but with UREC people. Um, so those are some of the tools that we're using. And, and I will I will say um, we had a town hall the other day uh, with faculty and staff with 1,400 people who participated. Um, and, and, and that was a Teams. That was, we used Microsoft Teams for that one, um, which, you know, is a phenomenal number. Earlier, we used Zoom and we had 900 people participate. Um, so, and, and the other day I was in a, in a, in a Zoom conference with 1,500 admitted students from all over the world. Um, so those are some of the things that we're using, uh, that they are, they are functioning very, very well for us. Um, so, so we're, we're living in the new normal. We can't wait to get back together physically, but, uh, safety has been our guidepost throughout and it will continue to be, um, the determining factor for everything that we do. Um, Mr. Galligan, before I go to, um, Dr. Smith, I, I heard you say that you all had, uh, uh, a meeting online meeting with 1400 uh, faculty and staff. Uh, and so in light of what took place there, how might the pandemic shape faculty training and development in the future? Uh, you know, I, I, I got out of the shower the other morning and it hit me that the debate about online education to the extent it continued in America is over. We have proven that we can do it. Now, now there are huge benefits to an in-person classroom experience, but I think we're going to see a lot more use of technology going forward. We're going to see a lot more flipping of the classroom. And, and Mayor President, we had never had that many people on at the flagship campus together in a room for a meeting. So what technology allowed us to do was basically have what at Little Colby Sawyer College, where I was president for 10 years, we used to have all campus meetings. And, and those aren't feasible where you have 5,000 employees, but because of the technology, we were able to have that all campus meeting. So, so I think in that regard, the technology holds promise to actually in some ways bring us even closer together than the physical world to, to which we are accustomed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, over at um, uh, BRCC, what kind of platforms are you using to deliver instruction and resources to your students? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I mean, let me also say thank you for your leadership on this uh, webinar to talk about keeping the promise. Certainly appreciate your support of BRCC and to all my colleagues out there in higher education. Appreciate seeing you guys and hope you guys are staying safe. As we're taking the BRCC, we are primarily using Canvas, uh, as our learning course, learning management tool, Zoom, Respondents, and Proctorio. Those are proactive, uh, proactively communicating detailed instruction to our students and expectations. I would say, though, BRCC also has an academic learning center that we are providing access to our students through our library, where we provide 100, 100 online databases to include thousands of electronic journals, magazines, newspapers, and 70,000 uh, e-books. We know that this transformation of this pandemic has caused us to act differently and support students differently. And I want to share a little moment on the question that you asked uh, Mr. Gallagher earlier about how this is going to shape faculty development. Let me first say, I want to say thank you to my faculty and staff who have basically worked the tails off trying to get students prepared and try to finish students up for the spring semester. 
in addition to that, I would like to thank our students. We have a BRCC app. And it was interesting to see the words of encouragement that our students was offering each other during this pandemic crisis. So I'm excited to lead this institution, certainly excited about the work that our faculty and staff doing. As pertains to how we shape our faculty training and development in the future, could you imagine being a faculty member where you have lecture bay clad that you have put countless hours in developing your notes and, and detailed messages that you want to say to the student? Now we got to prepare you now for a new digital age of technology using your lesson plan. And so that means many of our faculty will have to be retrained on how to use technology. Uh, many of our faculty will have to be uh, sensitive to meeting student learning needs or learning styles that student learns in different varieties, some through visual, some through lecture, but some through webinars and chat. I know we're in the digital age of the text and so, so forth. So our faculty are going to have to be engaged now on a, a whole lot of learning environments, learning environment for themselves to be able to support uh, students in the future. I would imagine the development or professional development will be changed. Probably won't be any more conference or travel for the near, for the short term future, but now faculty are going to be engaged just like students online in, in a digital atmosphere to be able to prepare their students for the future. Thank you. Um, this is a question for, for all of our uh, panelists as we think about moving forward. Uh, what discussions are taking place uh, concerning the summer and next school year? I know these are uh, inquiring minds want to know. And how will it affect your uh, students? How are you preparing for a safe reentry to campus? What discussions are taking place concerning the summer and next school year? And how are you preparing for a safe reentry uh, to campus? We'll we'll start uh, with you, Dr. Smith, since you're already up there, and then we'll move backwards. Thank you, Mayor, for that question. Well, we know we got some challenges ahead of us because of the social distancing. Uh, certainly with the stay at home order gonna be relaxed very soon. So our summer and fall course offer primarily online or synchronous. And what synchronous basically means that it's a combination of online, working remotely or chats or webinar, but even in the hybrid situation where we could do some limited hands-on face-to-face -face training. And so that was gonna consist of our summer, summer offering for now, but some of our fall offering is gonna continue to evolve based on what the social distance practice or policy gonna be in the future. So we are a comprehensive college where we also provide not just general education, but hands-on training. So that's going to be probably delayed for a time being. We're not sure, but certainly it's going to require us to act differently and to train differently, maybe attending the classroom and the welding program, a millwright program with one instructor, making sure we have accessible equipment, those sort of things. As we attain to safety, which is crucial to all of us to make sure we protect our faculty, staff, and our students, so we do a daily engage in sanitation or sanitizing all our facility, daily engage of making sure our restroom and all our uh, laboratories are basically sanitized every hour on the day. Also providing PP equipment to all of our staff and even our students to make sure that they are safe. And so these kind of practices are gonna continue to evolve as our college to maintain safety. And I would tell you that we are strictly enforcing the, the, the social distancing of 10 people and certainly six feet apart. It has been a challenge being a comprehensive institution, but I remain uh, committed to making sure we provide safety to all of our faculty and staff and our students. Uh, President Galligan. Uh, thank you. Um, Same question. Yeah, we will, we will be online during the summer. Um, and, uh, and we're also providing a 15% exemption on tuition and fees for students in the summer. Um, we want to make sure that our students academic progress is not impeded. So if somebody had to drop a class um, or a class doesn't work out this semester, we want to make education in the summer accessible, but that'll be that'll be online. Um, and, and as we go online in the summer, we'll also be bringing our, our faculty and staff back on campus in a phased approach with safety as our guide. Uh, in the fall, we are fully intending to be open and on campus in the fall. Our guide will be safety. Um, so, so will it be exactly like it usually is? Probably not. We're talking about larger classes, perhaps continuing online. 
We're talking about smaller classes that will be in bigger rooms. Um, we're talking about uh, having maybe uh, some some capacity restrictions in some of our bigger buildings. Um, the the union, for instance, the UREC. Uh, so we will look at all those things. We're also discussing daily the availability of testing. Um, so will we be able to test our faculty and staff and students um, and and both for antibodies and for uh, virology. And if we get a positive test, we've already identified the, the isolation spaces that we will use. So, so those are our plans, but again, safety will be the guide. Um, we're not gonna put anybody at risk, but however we're open, we will be open um, because we are not gonna get in the way of our students' academic progress. President Belton, what about Southern University? Sure, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, I guess my comments would somewhat uh, uh, echo uh, those of, uh, of, of my colleagues. It, it goes back to what you originally said about the degree to which uh, there that we've benefited from a lot of collaboration. And, and it is true uh, that uh, 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 we have, I think, spoke more recently than ever in the history. We, we really learned from one another we are guided by uh, Kim Hunter Reed, who is doing an outstanding job as a, as the commissioner, uh, and uh, we uh, actually uh, bounce things off one another, as such and, and learn uh, different strategies. And and so, uh, uh, like Tom and, and Willie was making mention, uh, Southern has already uh, made the announcement that we are going to facilitate summer school uh, in entirely online. We have, in fact, uh, last week, our board adopted a policy where we actually reduced fees for the summer school, uh, where it would only be tuition uh, and uh, no other fees, uh, uh, with the exception of that in light of uh, uh, the platform to which we are going to be relying on. Uh, we look forward to inviting students back uh, to the campus uh, in, in the fall. Uh, during the summer, we are uh, providing to our faculty uh, continual opportunities to, to, to develop themselves professionally, uh, get certified uh, uh, in the facilitation of instruction uh, online. Uh, but the fall will be, it, it will look different. You know, uh, we're uh, actually developing plans now in, in reaction to our value of uh, continuing social distancing, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be in residential halls, um, uh, ensuring that uh, the university community have access to PPE, uh, even uh, uh, considering uh, renovation projects where we could uh, possibly install plexiglass to maybe even limit uh, engagement uh, with, with, with the public. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, uh, but we do value and, and looking forward to the interaction uh, that we would anticipate upon students coming uh, back on, on campus. And so we, there will be a continual mix of face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Uh, as Tom said, albeit uh, valuing social uh, distancing at the same time, but also I, I think particularly in the fall, additional reliance on the delivery of instruction online uh, uh, in, in keeping with uh, our restrictions uh, uh, in terms of limiting engagement uh, over that over that time. Uh, President Belton and, and to all of the uh, our panelists, uh, I, I want to and I'm going to come back to you, Superintendent Drake, uh, with that question uh, a little later. Uh, you know, I have been using this term. Well, you've heard this term. Uh, we're about to enter a new normal. Uh, I am uh, capturing what I heard someone else describe it as a new reality, uh, because actually, it, it we won't be doing things normally. I, I understand the you know new normal, but it, it it is a new reality that we will be embracing as a. Uh, nation, as a state, as a city. And so when it comes to education, what do you think is the 
a new reality that COVID-19 has uh, reshaped uh, with the culture of education. How do you think COVID-19 is reshaping the culture of education? President Belton. Yeah, I, I think Tom uh, alluded to it. Uh, you know, for, for many years now, students have uh, given indication uh, of their interests uh, to engage uh, with us uh, online. Uh, uh, and, and there has always been a debate within the higher education community about, you know, the, the quality of online instruction and, and the degree to which, you know, face-to-face -face engagement provides for students a, a more substantive uh, experience. Uh, there have been faculty members who just rejected the notion of uh, facilitating in instruction uh, online. Of course, students, uh, because of war, you know, they're accustomed to it. We just weren't. And so, um, and so uh, I think with, with the advent of COVID-19, uh, people are taking another look at this uh, modality uh, and embracing it. And I think it ultimately provides students with, you know, more options you know, uh, in terms of things that we will provide students with more options in terms uh, to which they could uh, respond to in terms of the delivery uh, of, of their educational experience. We will, uh, we are being forced, uh, even if we chose not to design, to really look at uh, our technological infrastructure. And I think uh, whether, uh, and, and I think even uh, statewide and nationally, we need to ensure that we have a, a backbone uh, in terms of broad width to such that students, uh, even away from our campuses, will have appropriate access points to, to in, engage with us. And so I, I think that um, uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that we have rich offerings facilitated online, I think that is the new reality for higher education, where there had been resistance in the past. I think people are getting a greater sense about uh, its value, and I think we will uh, rightfully react uh, with enthusiasm going forward. I'm going to go back to you, Superintendent Drake. Um, how um, is our East Baton Rouge Parish school system uh, preparing for the next school year, uh, a safe re-entry to campus. And then we'll talk about the, the shift in this new reality of uh, COVID-19 and its impact on the culture of education. Superintendent Drake, what, what's going on uh, with EBR for the plans for the uh, next school year? Well, first, let me say that I believe that we are in a very unique place in American history right now. I think uh, history will show that this moment in our time has given us an opportunity to change the way we do business. And I think that we're going to be, we're going to see more things coming out of this opportunity to do things differently. So right now, summer uh, school will end officially in a few weeks. We have already converted to the summer program for feeding and for distance learning. So right now, our students, when they finish up this semester, they will go into several opportunities during the summer. One of them is uh, credit recovery. High school students need credit recovery. Some may just need to pass a course to pass a grade. And so we will have that uh, summer remediation for those students. But there's also going to be a very robust opportunity for our students to learn additional information through, through distance learning. So that, that is very unique and different. When we come back to school, we don't know exactly what school will look like. I don't think it will look the same as it looked last year or in years before. I think it will look totally different. We may, we may be in shifts when we go back to school. We may have fewer students in the classroom. We may eat our meals in the classroom. We may have some students staying at home one day and coming the next day. We don't know how that's going to look. Certainly, Certainly, face-to-face -face learning with teachers is unbelievable. And I think right now, parents are probably getting a new respect for teachers because uh, after the panic set in, then the reality set in that they really do have to homeschool them and help those students at home. So I think moving into the fall is going to be a 
totally new opportunity. We, you know, we've all heard the saying, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think there's going to be a lot of new created opportunities out of this. We have, we have uh, buses that are delivering devices right now. Brookstown Middle has uh, used their buses to deliver uh, devices, uh, computers over the summer. Our, uh, our board meetings are now virtual. As a matter of fact, as we speak this very moment, our board is virtually interviewing the five uh, superintendent candidates who will come on next year at some, this, after this next year at some point. So we're in a different world right now than we have been before. I consider our schools to be pristine when we come back. They should be absolutely pristine inside and out. Uh, we've been very careful. And of course, like you said, you provided us a number of uh, face masks uh, the, through the city and mayor's office. Other people have done this all over the parish to help us. And uh, we, we have been blessed with the opportunity we've been presented. And so we're gonna be ready for it. Of course, safety is always our number one priority. So as the other, my colleagues mentioned, we're going to make sure that we practice uh, safe distancing, uh, use PPEs and do what we have to do. Uh, but I think our, our staff has been so creative and our teachers have been so creative. We will have a viable, robust distance learning program come the fall that's in addition to just regular education in the brick and mortar building. So we're excited about the future. Uh, our health centers and schools is continuing to work and a lot of people are still working just as they did before we were out. So we've been blessed to uh, help our students and our families continue as much as normal as they can. Well, before we uh, get into questions from uh, those uh, listening and viewing, I'm going to take personal privilege and I have a, a little commercial break that is quite appropriate now uh, in that uh, I am hosting an essay contest for the graduating class of 2020. And the essay topic is, what should high school education look like in a COVID-19 culture? And so we're giving young people an opportunity to develop their own views around a central idea facing our community today. Uh, if you would like to uh, be a part of this essay contest, uh, you can go to COVID19essay at brla.gov. That's COVID19essay at brla.gov. Uh, the essays have to be submitted by uh, May 13th. Uh, we need a we need graduating seniors who are members of the class of 2020 can apply. You have to be under the age of 19 as of June 1st, a resident of East Baton Rouge Parish, and attending a high school within the parish at the time of the entry. And our first place prize uh, winner will receive $2,000. Uh, second place, $1,000 third place, 500, and two special recognitions at 250. So go to brla.gov slash COVID-19 essay. Um, uh, for the students uh, that are listening and for the parents that are listening, I just think this is a, a good way for some of our graduating seniors to uh, spend a little time uh, writing a, an essay with the potential of getting a little money in their pocket. What do you think about that, Superintendent? I think it's a great idea. I hope our students, uh, and I think they will, we'll get it out on the website, let them know what's going on, send us some information, we'll help promote it. Absolutely. Now let's uh, take some questions uh, that have been submitted uh, by our audience. Uh, what changes, if any, have been made to university admissions requirements due to the pandemic that graduating high school seniors should know about? I'm going to repeat the question. What changes, if any, have been made to university admissions requirements due to the pandemic that graduating high school seniors should know about? Uh, President Galligan, you want to start with that? I will start with that. Um, for us, there are there are no major changes to the admissions process or or requirements. Um, and and of course, I think I think everybody knows at LSU 
we do look at grade point, we do look at the ACT scores, but we also look at the whole person and we look at what else they've accomplished and have they overcome adversity and what other special skills do they have? So, so for us, things are, are pretty much normal. Um, I would say there are many other higher education systems in the country though that have changed. Um, University of the California schools are now test optional. Many other schools are test optional. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's still in the process of applying to college um, to uh, check with the schools to which they are applying to see if there's been any alter alteration of their basic um, admissions um, criteria. I do think one thing for, for all of us in higher ed who rely on any kind of test score at all is we'll see that those test scores will come in probably over the course of the summer more than they might have before, assuming that standard that that the testing agencies can give the standardized tests. Dr. Belton, what about at Southern University? There has not been a, a, a major change. Uh, as Tom made reference, I think uh, because uh, there has been the, the, the delay in administering the ACT uh, uh, has uh, affected many high school seniors, those who have not taken the test. And so the Board of Regents actually adopted a, a, a policy that enables uh, institutions to uh, uh, admit those students based on an institutional assessment to as opposed to an ACT score uh, in and of itself. And so if you have not uh, recorded an ACT score or SAT score, you could come to Southern, we will administer an institutional assessment to that aligns with the benchmarks of the ACT, SAT, and then provisionally admit you based on that placement uh, uh, score. Uh, now that, policy does not affect students who uh, I can appreciate it who are seeking uh, a tops uh, scholarship and so they would have to wait a little bit later you know until uh, that uh, test is actually administered in June and in July is my understanding but for those who want to enroll now they can do so uh, without the benefit of having a ACT score uh, whereas we would administer an institutional assessment to determine placement. Thank you. Dr. Smith, how will your university utilize funds received from the CARES Act to assist students during this pandemic? Thank you, Mayor. So we, uh, like all other colleges, are receiving resources from the United States Department of Education through the CARES Act. So currently, our funding is going to be uh sent out for aid to support students for the educational needs housing needs meals transportation so it's a flexibility on the amount of money that we can give to the student but they can use use it beyond the educational needs also a portion of that goes back to the institution to cover expenses and so we're going to make sure that we continue to get those funds out there in the next few days you uh, many students will be seeing uh who have, who are set up with us will be seeing money directly uh, deposit into the account in the next few days. And so those students will be able to utilize those funds in a variety of means, not just for educational purposes. Um, President uh, Belton and President Galligan, is this the same for your institutions or is there uh, something different taking place with the utilization of funds received from the CARES Act? Well, uh, at Southern, uh, all of our institutions within the Southern system have developed uh, 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 implementation plans that would enable them to uh, provide for students uh, grants through the uh, CARES Act. Um, for Southern, I would say within the next 10 days, all of our campuses will be implementing those plans. In other words, dispersing those dollars uh, we have uh, we've been very deliberate in trying to first uh, 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 trying to touch as many students as possible, both undergraduate uh, and graduate students, and first recognizing those students with the greatest financial need, and then uh, making disbursements 
uh, to all other students uh, based on a, a, a flat rate. And so uh, um, the Shreveport campus, I, I think they're going to provide those grants over the spring, uh, summer, and fall. But here in Baton Rouge campus, we're, we're dispersing uh, the entirety uh, of those grants for students who were enrolled in spring uh, 2020. And, and those should be going out uh, probably within uh, the next seven days. President Gallagher. Th thanks, Mayor. At LSU, um, substantially similar. We're, we're, we're finalizing our distributions as we speak. Um, we received to in total uh, $18 million for the flagship campus. <clears throat> the way the CARES Act works, half of that, it has to be distributed directly to students, which is they put students first and that's what we do too. So half of that will be distributed to students. We'll distribute 75% now um, and we'll hold 25% for students in need in the summer and the fall. Uh, and, and ours will be based um, primarily on the financial need of the student. The allocations from Congress were based on the number of Pell eligible students and FTEs. So we thought the spirit of that was to go first to those with the greatest need. So that's what we'll be doing. The other campuses that have students in the LSU family will be doing substantially the same thing. The other half of the 18 million we received um, we, we have, and we will use to reimburse for the costs that we've incurred as a result of COVID, which are pretty significant. President Galligan, I think you touched on this. This is another question from the audience. Um, and I think all of you all have uh, touched on this at the beginning, but I'm going to uh, ask it. What steps are your institutions taking to protect faculty as we transition back into the classroom? President Gallagher, you want to? I'm happy to start. I am happy to start. I just didn't want to step on anybody's toes. Um, <clears throat> we will uh, physically distance. Um, we will strongly encourage people to have masks. We'll have hand sanitizer everywhere. And if we have faculty who are at risk, um, I would expect that, in fact, I know, we'll provide opportunities for those faculty to teach online. Um, and, and again, as, as we come back to work, it's going to be gradual uh, and anybody who's not comfortable coming back, anybody who has family care responsibilities that prevent them from coming back. Um, we're going to be very sensitive to those needs. We, we've proven that we can work online way better than we ever thought we could work remotely. So, so we'll keep doing that as, as we get back to full speed. Is that the same for everyone else, or you all have some additional steps that you're taking that you want to comment on? It's primarily the same thing. We're going to be very flexible uh, uh, and listen to faculty in terms of their level of comfort. Uh, of course, we're going to uh, ensure that we have the requisite uh, PPE uh, for faculty and staff to engage uh, 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 with uh, students and throughout the university community, but pretty much the same way, really looking at our uh, uh, academic schedule uh, such that we can facilitate classes in a multiple in multiple manners, uh, such that uh, faculty can teach both online and in face and or uh, uh, a modality that they're most comfortable with. So pretty much what what Tom may mention. Uh, Dr. Smith, I have a question uh, directed to you. It says, how are community colleges positioned to help with the downturn in the economy? How are community colleges positioned to help with the downturn in the economy? Oh, a great question. Thank you, Mayor. So we all have seen in Louisiana 350,000 350, of our fellow citizens file for unemployment benefits in the past six weeks. We see what's going on across the country where 30 million unemployment claims have been made. And so our community colleges, by having a comprehensive mission, are position ourselves to be able to support uh, our, our citizens, but certainly our, those in the workforce with short-term training opportunities through accessibility. 
And so you talked about the new normal, new reality. Part of the things when you, we talked about curriculum and things earlier on, the developing programs and curricula that are short in nature that don't require folks to be in our classroom, but certainly taking months and years to complete. And so we're focusing as a community college by having short-term training programs, customized training programs that we can customize and offer credentials to our students and prepare them for the workforce. And so we're excited that we're able to offer and spin those things around. Also, we imagine that the downsizing of, of uh, institution and certainly our employers with many of them shutting their doors, there's availability on resources and scholarships through our foundation that we made available to support folks, not just for the emergency, but certainly scholarships to take part of the training initiative that we're gonna develop. And so we're positioned there to be able to support a whole variety of folks uh, who are out there, who are unemployed, who uh, want to be reskilled and don't have the resources or the wherewithal. And so we position ourselves to really jump on that. Additionally, I'd like to also speak to that we have it. You know, it concerns me and, and Superintendent Drake discussed it about our seniors, but our seniors also and our graduates of our colleges and university, what we're going to do for them, right? And how we position them and support them in the downturn of the economy. And so we exploring uh, having a virtual commencement very, very soon to make sure that we recognize our seniors need to get their degree where they can go to work and have some skills to protect themselves, to take care of themselves and their family. So those are some of the things that community college can be much, uh, can be able to take advantage of opportunity to support our citizens and, and those out there. And the second uh, question for you, which is uh, connected, I believe, to what you just shared, is what is BRCC doing as it relates to workforce development to support business and industry? So we're still working with our business industry partner. Just this morning, I was on the phone with Brack, our Baton Rouge Area Chamber, to talk about how we can support our business and industry partners, what kind of things we can do research on and look for them for the future as pertaining to job training. I would tell you early on, we, we were part of the Baton Rouge Area Chamber and Arts Council on designing PPE, masks for our healthcare workers. We have been restoring our hands-on industrial training with LED and Exxon Mobile to an extent we've been working with them. We have virtually restarted our North Baton Rouge initiative and may have certainly appreciated your support on that initiative. And those programs include welding, pipe fitting, electrical, and mirror right. We have virtual restarts of our allied health and training program to include certified medical assistants, pharmacists, and tech, phlebotomy, and medical billing and coding. And so all those things that we have started to do to support our business and industry, I would tell you because of the social distance practice, they're gonna be a small challenge, but some we recognize that we still need to maintain safety for those students who come in and train with us. And so those are some of the things that we are doing as well as stay abreast of new technology and advancement in technology where we can, we can prepare the workforce. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Superintendent Drake, the next two questions are for you. What is the plan for improving low performing DNF schools and remediation for those students? Well, let me go back and talk about the CARES Act a little bit. Uh, the $18 million we are receiving uh, from the CARES Act is funneled through our title program, which means it's for our students who are in the most need. So we're gonna use that money to focus on being equitable and making sure those, those kids in those schools have what they need through uh, enhanced summer program programming, through uh, infrastructure that they need, that's those, many of those students are the ones who haven't had the connectivity. So uh, the technology infrastructure, the connectivity for our students. Uh, also, those students are the ones, and that money will be focused in those areas first before it's uh, focused anywhere else. Uh, we, we have to get our schools better. Our students are working as hard as they can. Our parents are doing the best they can. But there's no doubt about it. We, we have to grow every year. We have grown academically four out of the last five years. The only year we did not grow was the year of the flood and not many districts grew that year. But I'm happy to say in the last two years, we have grown, we were the seventh fastest growing district in the state of Louisiana last year and the sixth fastest growing district in the state the year before that. So we're, we're moving in the right direction and it starts with those low performing schools. The next question for you, Superintendent Drake, is how are our children, the graduating seniors, 
able to obtain the required documentation to complete their registration for college? Well, that's being worked on with the senior team. We have a group of uh, senior, a team that's working with seniors through the principals. They will be, they can contact their school directly. They can contact their uh, executive director. The executive directors are working very diligently on this. We are, we're very focused and that is pretty much our number one priority right now because their, their schooling basically ends this week. This is their last week of school. And so we are focused on getting what, uh, making sure that they have what they need. So if you're, if you don't have what you need right now, if you're a parent out there, contact your school. You can contact the hotline through uh, our website, ebrschools.org, uh, or you can contact one of the executive directors or some, or even the teacher. The teachers are working directly with them as well. So we have a group of staff that are working with these seniors to make sure they have not. Uh, left anything behind. I will say this also, since March 13th, we, we missed an entire nine weeks of school. So that nine weeks right now, those students can go online and help their grades get better if they need to pass a class. But I think the probably the most important thing is staying in touch with their teacher and their uh, administrative staff in the schools. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for our um, higher education uh, leaders. How has COVID-19 impacted your enrollment or scholarships for the fall uh, semester? Uh, President Belton, you wanna start with that? So uh, I was telling the staff today that the greatest uh, challenge we have is one of uh, uncertainty, particularly as it relates to our enrollment. We are uh, at present monitoring uh, trends and, and quite frankly, the summer enrollment is gonna be higher uh, than what it was uh, last year this time. Uh, we, we nonetheless are uh, taking a much closer look at a fall enrollment trends, particularly as relates to, for us anyway, uh, out of state uh, uh, applications, uh, you know, for many, uh, there is uh, a belief that uh, Louisiana is a hot spot, and even South Louisiana uh, is. And so people are uh, awaiting evidence that uh, if they send their students, to their children to us, that it's going to be in a safe environment. Uh, we believe that, you know, the it, we have some responsibility in demonstrating and ensuring families that we are making the right decisions and providing the kind of infrastructure provide for them that security that uh, indeed their, their child will be safe. So outside of uh, out of state, uh, our, our enrollment, uh, uh, we, we anticipate it to be a uh, flat. Uh, and, uh, and I think the degree to which we can communicate a little bit better in terms of what we're doing may enable us to uh, enjoy the same type of enrollment that we had uh, last year. President uh, Galligan, how has COVID-19 uh, impacted your enrollment or scholarships for the fall semester? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right now, we, we seem to be in, in pretty good shape. And I would say that because our enrollment team is fantastic. Um, they've done a fabulous job of recruiting. I think I told you earlier, I was on a meeting with 1,500 admitted students from all around the world. Um, and there's only there's only one Louisiana, and uh, it's a wonderful place to go to school. But like like Ray, um, and I think everybody else, uh, safety first, and and we're going to promise our students and their families that we're not going to put them at undue risk. Um, we already give, I think, very generous scholarships, and certainly we'll monitor that over the summer for the students who. Um, have been admitted and deposited. If their situations change, um, we'll certainly we'll certainly respond to that. Uh, Dr. Smith, your uh, enrollment uh, in the fall. Do you think so, you'd be impacted uh, by COVID nineteen? Yes, I'm, I'm sure we will. I echo some of the sentiments of my colleagues on this on this webinar, uh, but certainly I think the major thing that that would concern me is persistent. I imagine both our students and faculty will struggle to adapt to the new online 
coursework that they're going to be engaged in. So I imagine our enrollment will probably tinker somewhere in the fall. But I'm encouraged by our summer enrollment. Our summer enrollment, we haven't even started yet, is up over 10%. And so that's exciting to see that our summer enrollment up or what have you. Also, Mayor would think that all of us, and certainly me, are very concerned about low income students and poor students not being able to enroll because I imagine many of their parents or even themselves probably have been laid off and got to work, probably can't afford to, to go to our institution. So now they're gonna need even more resource support from all of us. Certainly our foundation has stepped up to provide a scholarship, but I see that being a tremendous impact to our college, how we support our low, our, our poor students, our low income students, uh, and certainly students of color to make sure we can continue to, to support them on meeting their goal to complete and graduate. And so we are hopefully that we can do more enticing things. We created a virtual student center, as I talked about earlier, to say that they can still enroll, ask all the financial aid questions with counseling and tutoring advisement and so forth. But certainly we remain vigilant on making sure we get those students enrolled in our institution. The older kids, they aren't able to research because so many sites are blocked. Are the blocked sites individualized based upon the needs of the grade levels? Superintendent Drake. Mayor, I, I could only hear a part of that question. Could you repeat that, please? Absolutely. I apologize. Uh, it says that computers have been provided by the schools and they appreciate it, but those computers don't always work smoothly. The concerns that I hear are primarily based on the difficulties of spotty internet service causing frustration. And for the older kids, they aren't able to research because so many sites are blocked. Are the blocked sites individualized based upon the needs of the grade levels? Superintendent, you may be on mute. Are you on yes, mute, Superintendent? You. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm good now. So the short answer to that is yes. Uh, when we started this distance learning program in in March, uh, we we started it on Zoom, and it was uh, there were some issues there that we had to uh, make sure kids, you know, especially young kids, were not uh, did not have access to. So we do have some filters in there, and I think they're very important, especially for younger children. Let me mention this as well. You know, we are a one-to-one -one school district, which means every child grades three through 12 has a computer. Now, through the title program, we are purchasing uh, computers for pre-K through second grade. Every child in this district will have a computer. And so based on where you are, what you're studying, what you're doing, there will be certain safeguards in place to make sure kids are protected. The superintendent, you may have to write that answer down for us because we had a little break up in your connection as you were speaking, but I think we got bits and pieces of it. We did hear at the beginning uh, your question, your response saying yes, but we may ask you to jot that down for us and we could communicate it uh, later on. Um, I will, thank you. President Galligan, uh, what are the plans for housing at LSU next fall? Um, again, the, 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 we're, we're studying all those issues right now, um, and um, the, the plans are, again, safety will come first, and we're considering all our options. Uh, so if it's, if it's not safe to have roommates, then what does that do with our capacity? Uh, if it is, then we will have roommates. Um, so all of, those, all of those things are on the table, Mayor. Thank you, President Galligan. I think um, um, our technology here is either tired or something's going on because we have a lot of breakup, but I, I, I did hear uh, most of what, what you said there. Uh, I think you said that, are, are there going to be uh, roommates? Did you say that or no? What I said was there'll be roommates if that's, if that's a safe situation. Okay. If the C CDC and the government governor's guidelines say that roommates are a safe situation as long as 
space is adequate and then then we will have roommates if that's not a safe situation then and we have to isolate then then we'll then we'll do that obviously if we have to do that that affects our total capacity for housing yeah so that's a it's a fluid situation in other words you're still working it okay it, it is a totally fluid situation thank you um we have uh two more questions or maybe one more question uh and superintendent it's for you uh the last question is has east baton rouge parish considered a crisis intervention program for teachers and students then the second part of the question is how will we ensure that we are teaching young people how to cope with and navigate life in ways that also support their academic engagement and growth i'll repeat the second question again but the first part is has east baton rouge parish uh, school system considered a crisis intervention program for teachers and students well the answer is yes to that we have a committee working on on that particular question one of the things we want to make sure that we do is is have safety as our number one priority i heard the, my colleagues speaking about that so as we move back into a situation after the governor lifts the uh order for stay at home then we will probably do that in in uh phases uh, we will ask our leaders and uh departments to come back first and do that in, in a way where each one is feel safe we won't force anyone to do that so the safety part is really critical for us i think i think that's really a, an important thing i want to also mention that uh, we have different groups of people on this committee that are working on this so we have department heads we have parents we have principals we have different people like that we want to make sure everyone is involved in this process uh it, it's we are definitely in a crisis there is no doubt about it and when you're in a crisis uh, you have to make decisions sometimes that not everybody will agree with. Sometimes when you make decisions, you will have people wonder why that decision was, was made. But we always make those decisions, number one, on safety. You know, parents, uh, if you look at the research, parents pick schools because they're safe. Not academically, number one, it's safety that's always number one because they want to know their child is safe. And we're gonna make sure that our children are safe when they return to school. And school may look much, much different uh, when we come back. I, I wanna also take this moment to say thank you for our, to our parents. Our parents and uh, just for their participation and involvement. They've done surveys. They are home teaching their children right now. All the things that our parents have done, they have been, this has been a huge collaboration for us. I mean, we have 41,000 students over 5,000 employees. So the safety of our children, our employees are, is critical to us. So, but we also have to have high quality education. And when we come back to school, I can guarantee you that school is gonna look different. We will have a, a robust, vital distance learning plan as well as brick and mortar plans. And uh, just all of the research that, that goes into uh, having this type of opportunity for our kids. So I want to thank all of our parents, and uh, and I want to say also, as most of you know, this is uh, my last second to last month as superintendent, and it, it has been a true honor and just a, a great honor to serve this community as superintendent of schools. So I want to thank everyone for that. Thank you, uh, uh, Drake. I have two things to say. One is you got a lot of work to do before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. And the second one is, I believe that um, your original response to the crisis intervention program, uh, you've established um, a committee. So I uh, assume that um, uh, part of the crisis intervention program will be helping to teach our young people uh, how to cope with and navigate life uh, that will also support their academic engagement and growth. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that again, because I think what this pandemic has done to us is probably the mental health part of it is probably one of the, the most important uh, byproducts of this. 
uh, the isolation. We're not, we're not built for isolation. And just the isolation itself is very, very difficult. It's difficult on me. It's difficult on everybody. Our board had a virtual uh, just get together one night a few weeks ago, just so we could see each other's faces and visit. Uh, so it, the, the mental part of this is truly the hardest part. And so we've been working with our counselors. Uh, we give a lot of autonomy to our principals and they're working with uh, small groups to make sure that our children are doing okay mentally, uh, as well as physically. We're teaching PE virtually and just all aspects of, of education. Education is not just the X's and O's in that classroom. It's taking care of our children. It's, it's giving them a it's doing what we want, what we need to do for them. And, and it's truly been an honor to work with our children and our families on this. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to the close of our uh, webinar. Uh, would any of our panelists like to uh, have some closing comments before we close out? Yeah, hey, Mayor, this, is, this is Willie Smith. I'd like to say thank you again to you and your team for allowing us to to be part of this, keeping the promise. I would also would like to share with my colleagues and even you, uh, this time it gave me a chance to spend time with my family a little bit more so than I probably wanted to, right? But also in a little bit, to read a little bit more. So I just pulled off the shelf, Tom Brokaw, The Greatest Generation. I imagine this is the time where we can read that book and talk about this pandemic probably will put us on making sure we'll be a new, uh, be even greater generation going forward because we have worked together collaboratively your leadership and the rest of our local and state leadership have been instrumental to us in supporting all our citizens. And so I say thank you for allowing me to be here and appreciate it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in and Mayor say thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for coordinating this uh, panel discussion and thank you for your leadership and thank you for the capital area promise. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you as we've all done to our faculty, our staff, and our students for the wonderful, and families for the wonderful work that they've done, they've done. And I would close by saying, sometimes education and higher education um, comes under a little heat in the, in, the, in the press for this, that, or the other thing. And I would say, boy, look at what we've managed to accomplish. And, and I think that after this, the, the people's attitude towards education towards research and towards our ability to turn on a dime and implement it is is going to be really through the roof and I thank all my colleagues for that too so thank you very much well madam mayor president I I too would like to just join my colleagues and and again commend you for uh, facilitating uh, this town hall uh, meeting uh we have jokingly uh given indication of the degree to which you know we probably talk more than we've ever uh have talked and, and and i say that uh within our system and across our systems and i think uh we we have benefited from that you know uh during this time um you know i value ideas and and uh and i have uh uh I've, I've heard many, but one of the things that has distressed me more so in recent weeks uh, has been the suggestion that uh, many students are contemplating uh, waiting out a year or uh, uh, and, and or deferring their aspirations in light of their quest uh, to uh, uh, go to college and and get a, a full realm of the college experience. And, and as Willie may mention, many families are, are truly in a crisis financially where they just don't see where the resources are there for them to uh, continue their, their educational aspirations. My fear, however, uh, is that, you know, deferred uh, aspirations, life has a way of filling in those gaps when you don't take advantage of it uh, at that time. And so I really wanted to, you know, encourage students, you know, to uh, continue to advance their aspirations uh, to the point of continuing their education at the post-secondary level. We benefit from a lot of talent and, and really uh, 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 institution who 
uh, is committed to ensuring that our students will be in a safe environment, one that's engaging nonetheless, uh, and uh, whose goal is to ensure their success. And so uh, I, I, again, just wanted to uh, uh, as, express uh, our collective commitment and, and say to my colleagues how much is, it is a pleasure uh, for me to be a part of a higher education and education community that puts students first. Thank you, Madam President. Mayor, I want to say thank you also for hosting this event. Uh, th this has been a, a good dialogue. And I want to say we all know that the Capital Area Promise is for our children. So from East Baton Rouge Parish's perspective, I want to say that our children every year, sixth graders go to LSU. Every sixth grader in our, in our system visits LSU. Every seventh grader in our system visits Southern University. Every eighth grader in our system visits Baton Rouge Community College. So I want to thank the colleagues here, the presidents of these fine universities who support our students. And we have shown a significant growth in seniors attending these universities over the last four years since this promise has been going on. So I want to thank you for hosting this. I want to thank my colleagues as well. Well, well, I want to thank all of you. Uh, I, I will say a special thank you to the work that's being done by the Capital Area Promise Core team and uh, all of your collaborative efforts for uh, the city of Baton Rouge. You see our uh, partners there and Superintendent Drake, you certainly uh, spelled out and let everyone know uh, and summarized what the Capital Area Promise is all about. Uh, I wanna first say, uh, Superintendent Drake, thank you uh, certainly for uh, your uh, service to our students here in East Baton Rouge Parish. You will be missed, but remember what I said, you've got some work to do before you leave, so you're not out yet. <laughs> and certainly uh, to uh, President uh, uh, Belton at Southern University, President uh, Galligan at LSU, and uh, uh, President uh, Chancellor at um, Dr. Smith at uh, BRCC, thank you all as institutions of higher education uh, for being a part of the fabric of our community. I am so proud that we have uh, these uh, stellar institutions of higher education as part of the fabric of uh, our city, of our parish, of our, of our state. So thank all of you all for your leadership. Uh, and we want to thank all of our viewers today. Thank you for taking the time to participate in today's town hall. Each of us today play an important and essential role toward the greater work to improve educational opportunity and oppor uh, outcomes in East Baton Rouge Parish and beyond. I want to remind you as we close, and thank you for being with us today, as we uh, continue moving towards this new reality, and as we continue to uh, navigate the COVID-19 crisis, let me encourage you to stay calm, stay home and stay strong during this time. Our entire community certainly is in my prayers as we navigate this pandemic and as we move on the path of recovery. Thank you and have a great day.